third and last day of the conference, uh, which we start with the, the third invited uh, speaker uh, today. Uh, regular attendees of this conference know that we, we tend to invite people who are outside of the community development field, sometimes anthropologists, neuroscientists, philosophers, uh, uh, or comparative uh, behavioral scientists uh, whose, whose work I maybe think is relevant for, for community development uh, like you. And this is happening today as well. Uh, the speaker will be Martin Jurfa. Um, so there, are, there could be many reasons why we invite uh, comparative uh, uh, psychologists or comparative behavioral scientists to this conference. One is that uh, uh, if you are interested in, in how, what, what, what's the start where infants start to develop, then it's actually worth looking at other species, uh, neighboring species, like for example primates, that, that, that to know what cognitive capacities they have. There could be methodological reasons as well, right? Because uh, uh, just like um, uh, when we work with infants, you cannot actually give them a task the same way as you can do with adults. So this, 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 you have the same problem facing if you work with animals as well. And the third reason could be actually to think about uh, to, to, to limit your theories that you can develop about, about cognitive development in humans, right? In the sense that if you have some ideas about what cognitive capacities that children develop depends on language or culture or cultural evolution, that it's worth looking at other species uh, that, that don't have language or, or don't have culture, at least not in the same sense as, 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 as humans have. Uh, and if that's the case, then it's actually worth looking at far away from the phylogen phylogenetic tree. The farther away you go, the less likely that they have, uh, they start from the same capacities. So that would actually limit your theories, what's possible and what's not possible uh, without language and, and culture. So Martin is working with a, a species which is rather far away in the phylogenetic tree uh, from humans, uh, honeybees. Uh, he's uh, 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 Argentinian, uh, he worked uh, about in Germany and then for a long time in, in Toulouse in France and recently he just moved to uh, Paris with all his honeybees together and he's, he's setting up his, his research lab uh, over there. Um, has done very, very interesting work uh, on, on honeybees. Um, and you are going to hear about them, so I'm not going to list all, 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 all his interesting research. So if you haven't actually seen his work yet, then fasten your seatbelt and expect an amazing ride. So please welcome Martin Jurfa. Oh, I have my... Thanks a lot. You, you can hear me, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks Ergo for the very kind presentation, very kind introduction, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. It is indeed a big pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to present to you the work we have been doing. It's not the first time I come here, it's always a big pleasure actually, because it's really inspiring to meet friends, to exchange about science, uh, what else can you ask for actually, and then to go back with lots of new ideas, and that's actually the best reward for me uh, while coming here, so thanks for the opportunity. So um, what I would like to do today is to tell you about some uh, works we have been doing over the years, uh, asking in, uh, about the cognitive capacities and the mechanisms of these capacities in these uh, little creatures that you can see here, the honeybee. So um, one of the, the, the things we might start uh, with uh, this talk is introducing these, these two brains with these huge differences, actually. So what you see here is a human brain, a frontal view of the human brain with its known volume, the known uh, impressive amount of neurons it possesses, and uh, of course it's not at the same scale, I mean the, the, the scheme actually, or, or the picture, uh, because you realize by looking at the numbers that there are huge, huge numeric differences in terms of these, uh, comparing these two brains. This brain has just one cubic millimeter, as you can see here, tiny, tiny brain. 
and it has one million neurons. In fact, even less, 950,000 neurons are the current counts of, uh, that, that uh, are representative for, for this tiny brain. So then, of course, when you realize these huge differences in numbers, in volume, and so on, one of the questions might be, why should we care about studying, say, some form of cognitive processing in these creatures? If there is something, perhaps there is something, it should be quite primitive. That would be a guess. Um, there are many reasons to counter-answer, actually, the, this, this kind of position. Um, these creatures are a real model for studying cognition in a natural context, because what you see here, actually, the, the honeybee forager, uh, it's an animal that is programmed, actually, to learn and memorize multiple features constantly in the field. So these animals um, have something called uh, flower constancy, which is shown here. Uh, this is the fact that for, uh, bee act bees actually do not switch from one flower species to the other while foraging in the field. They remain working on the same species as long as the species provides profitable nectar and pollen reward. So they work in a chain, let's say, in that way. And that actually is what explains that you can have, I don't know, sunflower honey or things like that, lavender honey, because they don't mix, they don't switch. They collect on a single species at a time. Uh, the explanation for that is well known, is the fact that they learn and memorize in a very efficient way the features of the flowers they are exploiting at a time. They learn the colors, they learn the odors, they learn the shape, they learn the position in space, and that is exactly what allows them to return back and forth to the same spot or the same species they are tracking as long as it provides the food they are looking for. The other reason to, to, to work with these animals is that they are experimentally accessible. So, meaning by that, that you can train them and test them in controlled laboratory conditions to ask questions about the capacities that you're looking at. For instance, you can ask questions about how good you learn these colors or how good you discriminate these odors. How long does your memory last? Can you generalize? Can you actually discriminate these different stimuli and so on? And the answer of the beast will be, of course, encoded in the behavior it will provide in the setups, in the experiments you will have conceived to ask these questions. They are cooperative in the sense that as long as you will provide the little drop of sugar water they are looking for, they will be coming hundreds of times to the lab to provide you with answers to the questions you're asking. So, um, and of course, there is no break at noon for a sandwich and so on because they want food. And you have to be there, you're the slave of the bees, because otherwise they stop coming and then your experiment is lost, okay? So, but um, the other reason for, for, for studying these animals is, because I'm a neuroscientist actually, is that they have a relatively accessible and simple, in quotes, uh, you can see here, nervous system. I told you 950,000 neurons, it's not much, but precisely because of that, uh, the possibility of tracking for specific circuits underlying this or the other capacity is feasible. And we have developed uh, through the years uh, many, many tools actually to access these circuits and see how they are actually responding while the animals are solving tasks. Um, and the interesting thing, and it's actually the typical question I get, probably not from this audience, but from neuroscience audience, why don't you work with Drosophila? Of course we do, we have also Drosophila in the team because it allows to use a lot of genetic tools. But the reason why we love these creatures is that so far these are the only insects in which higher order forms of learning have been found and characterized. Drosophila can of course learn simple associative relationships, say order A means sugar, order B means punishment, simple associative links, of course, as many other insects, but the only creatures that do more than that are these, these animals, and you will see that. So perhaps actually to, to convince you that they can do more than that, I will show you a, a first experiment, which is kind of introduction to the talk, is a kind of old experiment already, but because I guess most of you do not know this kind of research, it's, I think, a good introduction, actually. So, uh, and here, actually, it's an experiment which was the first to address the issue of conceptual learning in these animals. Of course, we knew over the years, and there have been thousands of experiments showing that free-flying beasts, like the one you can see here, can be easily trained to associate, say, 
visual stimuli to sugar water, like they're coming from the hive and then they will find a drop of sugar water on say a yellow disc or a blue disc. They will learn this simple association very easily. Um, but the question here was to move from that simple associative learning to uh, conceptual learning. And uh, what I mean by that in this particular case is relational forms of learning, learning about relations. Uh, and this learning about relations, as you all know, must be somehow independent of the physical nature of the stimuli mediating the relationship. What you learn is the relation itself, not that the stimulus A or the stimulus B are blue or yellow and so on. One counts is the relationship. And uh, actually, um, the, the first relation we wanted to address when we started this area is whether animals could learn the concept of sameness, the conceptual rule of sameness, which is very well known actually and well studied in the vertebrate literature using a protocol or a paradigm called the delay matching to sample. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this, actually it consists in showing a subject just an object, a sample, then nothing happens, you just show it for a short while, and then after that you show the same object against another one. And then, of course, the subject has to realize, uh, being confronted to many objects that are changed all the time, that the underlying rule that provides the access to reward is choose what has been shown before to you, irrespectively of what has been shown to you. So it's not the fact that this is black or that this has this shape or whatever that provides the answer to the problem. The problem is actually a relationship-based problem. So you have to, cho to choose what has been shown to you before, the sample. And uh, of course, if the animals can learn this, it's already a big step. But the capacity for conceptual learning is shown if the animals can transfer the rule to stimuli they never saw before. And then, in this case, we are really in a situation of conceptual learning, a rule transfer to novel stimuli, it's really a rule. So this was done actually by training bees to, to come into the lab and uh, fly into a particular Y maze. You can see here the bee and you realize, for instance, that you know this is your bee because it has, for instance, a little green spot on the abdomen. So you mark your bee and you follow the bee all day long and you do not allow other bees into the setup as long as this one has not finished with the whole schedule, okay? So how do you do that, actually? So it's very easy. You go to the hive entrance, you put a little Petri dish with sugar water, you wait for the bees to detect them, and then step by step, you move them actually into the direction of the lab, and then they will learn the way and they will start coming into the lab by themselves just to find the, 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 the sugar reward. And then you shape actually their entering into the maze and they will learn that and will work for you. As I say, very cooperative creatures indeed. So, um, so the question is whether they can solve this delay matching to sample problem actually. Uh, in other words, if they can learn this sameness relationship. So um, this is, for instance, the training uh, uh, which was performed with one of the groups of the animals. So here you see, for instance, the animals were trained to come into the lab, and then there is a maze here, and um, they go into the, through the window, they land uh, here on a table, and then they go into this white maze. Here there is a yellow disc at the entrance with a hole in the middle. That is the sample, what you show them at the entrance. So they have to pass through a hole in the middle of the disc, and now they have to make a choice. That's the protocol. And of course, because this is what is shown at the entrance, the right choice is to choose the yellow disc. If they land on the yellow disc, they get the sugar drop. If they land on the blue disc, it's wrong. They are expelled from the maze. They don't like that because they lose time and energy and so on, and they have to do the whole thing again. So, okay, so yellow, yellow. Then five minutes later, they will be back from the hive looking for more reward. And then you will show, for instance, the blue disc at the entrance. Blue that was punished before, but that's not important because this is now what is shown at the entrance of the manx. So in this case, they have to go to blue. So if you see yellow, you go to yellow. If you see blue, you go to blue. And of course, you randomize sites to avoid that these animals go always to one side or the other. But this... Even if they learn these relationships here, this is not enough, as I said. You need a transfer situation. So when the animals were more or less mastering this situation, they were confronted to something totally new. They arrived here and they saw this, which is achromatic patterns, vertical or horizontal. So, um, and so in this case, there are two possibilities. Either the animals are totally disoriented because they never saw these stimuli, uh, which are not natural stimuli, of course, and or they have a rule, and in this case, 
in seeing the vertical one, they would go for vertical, or in seeing the horizontal one, they would go for horizontal. The experiment was done in both directions, meaning that you had the beast trained on colors and test on the patterns, as here, but you had also another group of animals trained on the patterns and then test on the colors as a new stimuli. So this is what we got in this experiment. This is the learning curve, uh, and these are blocks of 10 visits to the make. So in other words, 60 times the bees flying, commuting between the hive and the lab and the, and the wine maze. So to give you one idea, this represents an entire day of work uh, for a bee. And that's another advantage, of course, because I mean, I have many colleagues working on similar protocols in primates, and they need, of course, months to train animals for that. Here, it goes faster. But their life is shorter also, you have to consider that. So, but in any case, it goes very well. You can see that this is practically a day of training without stops. And you can see that at the end of, of the day, both groups, the group trained with colors, so yellow, yellow, blue, blue, and so on, and the group trained with patterns, vertical, vertical, horizontal, horizontal, manage very well. They are at 75, 70% 70 uh, uh, correct choices, which is not bad for a bee, actually, seven times from 10 is quite good. But the critical moment comes now when they face the transfer situation. So the bees train with the colors here in red will arrive and will see for the first time the vertical grating at the entrance uh, or the horizontal grating. And when this happens, uh, already in the very first choice, they prefer vertical. And if it's horizontal, they go for horizontal. The animals train with uh, pattern. Uh, when they saw the blue or the yellow colors for the first time, uh, if it was blue already in the first decision, they went for blue, and if it was yellow, they went for yellow. So um, this experiment was quite exciting to us because it showed us for the first time at that time that these animals can master conceptual rules, that they are not just associative machines as people used to believe, that they can learn simple associations like yellow reward or blue punishment. There is much more here. and uh, and. It, I have no time to show you other experiments, but here, for instance, there was also a transfer between colors and others in the same kind of rule learning, uh, which means that these conceptual rules are not tied to the initial domain of training, but can be transferred to new stimuli in different domains. Uh, also, no time, but I mean, in this same work, we showed that the opposite rule can be learned, which is choose always the contrary to what I'm showing you. If I show you yellow, then you have to go to blue and so on. So they also mastered very efficiently this rule. Uh, and meanwhile, of course, we have done lots of experiments showing that they can learn many, many different rules, many conceptual rules, for instance, spatial concepts or relational rules related to space, like choosing always something that is above a certain reference or below a certain reference, and you change the stimuli and the rule is kept constant, for instance, or to the right of or to the left of. Or, uh, for instance, like in this image, uh, which was a work by my PhD student, Aurora Vargas, uh, combining two rules simultaneously, like a conjunction of two rules, which is the fact that the animals had to, choo to choose uh, images where you had one stimulus above the other, not adjacent left-right, but so above the other. And on top of that, the second rule is they had to be different. If you have the same respecting the right positioning, it was not good. So they have to, and they transfer, of course, they choice to novel stimuli respecting this double rule. So, and, and one of the things we have been also investigated, actually, is the fact that there are also numerosity concepts, which was new at the time. So this was actually discovered um, using the same protocol I mentioned, I described before, the delay matching to sample protocol. But in this case, it was applied to numerosities. This was a work uh, with my friend and collaborator, uh, Xiao Wu Chang. And at that time, actually, he used <coughs> sorry, a different kind of maze. Uh, but the principle is the same. So this is the maze, you can see here, the bees arriving here, and this is the entrance wall in which uh, uh, numerosity will be displayed. For instance, as you can see here, two stars. This is, of course, non-symbolic numerosities, two stars. And then the animal travels into the maze and then enters into this chamber, and then there's one image here and another image here. They both provide access to these chambers, but only this one, you can see, gives access to a chamber where there is reward. Here, there is nothing. So uh, in this particular case, the question was whether animals would be able to solve 
a delay matching to sample problem based on number, okay? So for instance, when the animals were shown two at the entrance, they would see here in the decision chamber, two versus three. And you can see that uh, care was taken to avoid using, uh, again, same color, same shapes, everything was randomized and so on to avoid animals uh, fixating a particular non-numeric queue. They really had to focus on the numeric queue to solve the problem. So if they saw two, they had to go to two. And in another trip, or the same B, of course, if it was shown with three, it had to go to three, okay, to get access to reward. So to make a, a long story short, this experiment showed that uh, the animals were able to solve the problem and solve the uh, delay matching to sample based on numbers. Uh, meanwhile, we note that they can count until five, that they solve the problem efficiently until five, which is not bad considering performances in crowds, for instance, which reach similar levels of, 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 of uh, numerosity. And, uh, but beyond five, it breaks. It, it is not very good. Uh, even, I mean, of course, there is the typical uh, properties of the numeric system that you can find elsewhere, which is a very accurate around small quantities, one, two, and as long as you move to four or five, it becomes less precise, but nevertheless, it works. So um, what I would like to show you now related, there are many experiments actually that were done in terms of, of uh, B numerosity. Uh, Aggie, you were asking me about one I didn't, didn't decide to, to show today because it would be too much, but just for, to give you an idea, uh, my postdoc uh, Scarlett Howard was able to show that they have the concept of zero actually. Uh, that's the one you wanted, but perhaps we can show it or discuss it later. Uh, but no, no, no time to show that one today. Uh, but I would like to show something new, uh, and something new which I like very much because it was my way to survive COVID, actually. Uh, indeed, actually. So it, the story goes like that. I, uh, knowing that, the, that bees have a sense of, of number, actually, there was an immediate question that, that uh, uh, arose discussing with friends like Stan Deanne and other people. Uh, and, uh, and the question was, do they have something like the snark effect, the spatial numerical association of response codes? This was something I wanted to address, and I was discussing that for a while with two friends, Rosa Rugani, uh, who uh, is uh, right now in, in Italy, who got a professorship right now there, and with Catherine Tevno, who, who is uh, actually someone working in your field, actually, uh, uh, Children Numerosity in, in Lausanne. And, uh, and we plan everything. We had already funding, we had already student. Uh, the person should come from Lausanne to Toulouse. I was formerly based in Toulouse. We had everything prepared for the experiment and then boom, COVID arrived. So it was not possible to do anything. As you, I was confined uh, in my house. And I say, God, this is very depressive. So what can I do? I had the chance to live more in the countryside of, uh, of Toulouse. And so there were lots of bees in the garden. So, uh, and I say, OK, why I do not turn into my own student and do the experiments by myself? That would be a great way to survive in COVID. So I started, I mean, I decided to train my bees. But of course, I had no appropriate material. So I say, OK, I need to have a maze and so on. So I say, OK. Uh, we have there a case of wine, so uh, French wine. I mean, you should never should uh, miss in, in, a, in a house, actually. So, and, and then, so with some tools, I, I transformed my wine case into a maze and started training my bees, actually, into the garden. Uh, and they responded in a fantastic way. So I had, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, given the tragedy that was COVID for everyone, but, I mean, I had a great time doing that. Uh, so, and, and actually the question is uh, whether these animals have a mental number line like numeric representation. So if they would assign smaller uh, non-symbolic quantities or numbers more to the left and, uh, um, and, and larger ones to the right. Of course, we were aware that there are lots of arguments 
claiming that this has a strong cultural basis related to education, writing, and so on, and that it may change across cultures. And of course, we do not deny that. That's obvious that this is the case. But at the same time, we had evidence, you might know this evidence better than me, newborns, actually, by Di Giorgio and so on, showing that if you habituate a baby, even newborns of uh, 50, uh, 50 hours uh, born babies or things like that, if I remember well, to uh, certain numbers of dots, and then you switch off the image, and then you provide the same quantity, smaller or larger, on each side. If the quantity is smaller to the one that was habituated, the bees will tend to look to the left. And if it's larger, the bees will look to the right. So showing that beyond culture, there is an inborn, actually, snark effect there. And this has been even shown in chickens by, actually, Rosa Rugani, who did a, a very nice paper uh, showing that the same protocol can be adapted to chicken. Chickens train to go and collect food at a particular panel with a certain numbers of dots. And then if you take out the panel and then show two, the same numerosity, say one and one on either side, the animals will prefer going to one on the left. And if it's three on three, they will go to three on the left, depending on the quantity that was habituated, of course. So that was the idea. And, and this is the, the protocol that we wanted to adapt here uh, to ask the question to the bees. This is, by the way, my wine case, actually. So uh, I made some, some holes, some sliding door. The bee has to enter here. This is the first chamber where there is nothing. Then they go to the second chamber. And here, they will go here and see, for instance, three. You can see here three black squares, different sizes, and so on. And uh, the animal will collect food in the middle of the stimulus. There is a little tiny hole providing the sucrose solution there. That's the training. And of course, we would train, say, for instance, to three with many different stimulus, like the one that you can see here. These are just some examples. Uh, it could be squares. It could be triangles. It could be circles. And of course, the position was also randomized and so on. Uh, no time here to show you all the controls we did to exclude low-level cues. We did that, of course, uh, to take care of the many parameters like area, total area, contour, and all the things that you have to control in these experiments. Uh, but essentially here you can see that the animal is trained to three, and then in, when the moment of the test comes, we suppress this image, and we actually turn these two panels and show them one and one for instance, with the question what they would do. Would they, like the babies, tend to go to one on the left after being trained to three? And the same can be done by showing five and five. So important, what you show when you show five and five is exactly the same stimulus. It's not the same quantity. It's the, not just the same quantity. It's the same image on the left, on the right. So, uh, and, and exactly that's what we wanted to know. If they would prefer one specific site for the two identical options. And will this side vary depending on the number displayed during the training? So uh, yeah, you can see Chateau Fontarnay, actually. <laughs> they are not paying me anything, actually. I should get some kind of funding from these people, but I don't think they care about bees. But, uh, and that's the way it works, actually. You see, they are very fast, and they are playing the game. Duck, here it is. It's a market bee. Perhaps you saw there was a little white spot on the thorax. Now it's collecting uh, food, and then it will come back five minutes later. And so uh, we will do like uh, uh, 30 training visits uh, with three changing all the time. So it's three, 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 30 times, but not the same three. Three squares, three circles, three dots, position changes, and so on. Uh, and suddenly uh, the question is whether after being trained in this way, would they go to one on the left? or they would go to five on the right. So these are the results of this very first experiment, actually. So um, this is the, the training. You train them on three, and then you test them on one and one, or you test them on five and five. And uh, here you have two, two graphs. One is uh, reporting what they did in the very first choice, and the other one is what they uh, did if you count 30 seconds. You ch you, it's, it's the same, essentially but we decided to increase the, the, the recordings and counting the choice during 30 seconds. But you can see that the results are essentially the same. So what does it mean? It means that when the animals were trained on three and then they saw one and one, they prefer one on the left. You can see here choices for the left option. So they prefer one on the left. But if they saw now five and five in the test, uh, they did not prefer 
five on the left, they prefer five on the right, which is actually what you see here. Uh, the same for the cumulative choices, which means that indeed, like the babies, like the chicks, actually, they order it uh, one on the left of three and five on the right of three, uh, which is the reference number used. But now we wanted to know what happens if we change the reference number. The, the snark effect, of course, is relative to the number you're using as a reference. In the previous case, it was three, but we might change the reference number and we might see different effects. Um, so we had two groups of animals in this particular case. Uh, one group of animals was trained on one, like here. Okay, so one, 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 30 visits using a circle, a square, a triangle, changing the position, uh, and so on. Okay, another group of animals was trained on five. Again, 30 visits with five, 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 uh, presented by different means, but always five. Both groups, actually, after finishing the training, had exactly the same test, which is now three and three, okay? But they were coming to the test from different sides. One group was coming from five, for which three should be smaller, and one group was coming from one, for which three should be higher, okay? So, uh, and this is what happens, actually, uh, in, in this experiment. So here I'm showing you, because now the test is the same, choices for three on the left, arbitrarily, okay? So both groups come, are tested with three, so I'm showing you choices for three on the left. And you can see that when the animals were trained on one, they don't like three on the left, okay? They prefer three on the right, one, three. They go to three on the right. If the animals uh, were now trained on five, okay, you can see now they prefer three on the left. So oh, five, three, so, sorry. Okay, so the same for the cumulative choices, which shows the same pattern of, of results. It shows that actually uh, this association of, of a number with the right or left side of space is not absolute, which is an essential property of these mental uh, um, number lines, actually. Um, it's not absolute, but depends on the reference number, on its magnitude, actually. And this is what is shown here. So B strain on one associated three with the right, and if B strain on five associated three with the left. So there are more experiments in this work, but of course I think these two are enough to make the point that, uh, that there is something like a left to right spatial representation of non-symbolic number, okay? So, uh, quantities uh, shown by means, say, of dots or squares or triangles and so on which provides, at least to me, further evidence for the convergence between the numeric sense of vertebrates and invertebrates. So we have been discussing, the, in terms of numeric cognition, the capacities of vertebrates, actually, to, to solve or, 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 or uh, solve problems related to numerosity uh, using non-symbolic numbers. But now what I'm claiming here, or showing you, actually, is that this can be extended to some invertebrates, at least bees, actually, uh, and, uh, and, and that actually is, uh, is something that uh, goes together with many other experiments like the one I mentioned, the concept of zero, the capacity to count until five, and so on, and many other properties that have been shown in these animals, actually. So uh, one of the typical questions that people ask me is, why should they care about that? What should they count? And there are answers that have been already provided. These animals have a unique feature compared to other insects. They are central place foragers, meaning by that that they are not flights just traveling randomly in the environment. They have a central place. They have a home to which they have to come back, the hive. They have to navigate over incredible distance for the little sites. So bees this size, just consider that the bee can navigate six to eight kilometers, actually, and find a way back to the, to the hive, actually, just to exploit profitable food sources. That's quite unique. Not all insects do that. Well, some ants, ants and, and other social insects do that. So, but, um, but in doing that, actually, what has been shown is that counting is used to actually decide when to land after a certain number of objects or landmarks passed. Actually, um, that can be used, for instance, when the sun is not available uh, with, because they use a, 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 the sun as a main reference for navigation. 
But this is a possible explanation. It's an essential information for navigation, for returning home or going to the food source they are exploiting. Remember also that they do not go randomly to a food source. They are informed, instructed by other bees telling them by means of a dance that they have to fly, say, 350 meters to the east in order to stop there and get the food reward. Okay, so, uh, but this is just speculation so far. Uh, and the question is why this line should be there, why this representation should be there. Uh, we don't have the answer, but we are exploring some uh, possibilities. And one is that this kind of representation might be proper to many brains with lateralized uh, information processing. So um, the, there is actually uh, a demonstration, we have demonstrated that, and others too, that the brain of the bee, which has also two hemispheres, uh, shows a very, very accentuated lateralized processing for visual information, for olfactory information, and so on. Essentially, for many of the cues that have been addressed, uh, and not only by behavioral test, which you can do, for instance, by in covering one eye, leaving the other eye free, and so on, but also by recording into the neural circuits, you show actually, you, it has been shown that they are much better on the right side than on the left side, uh, in general terms, of course. And, um, but the question that we are addressing right now is whether this brain asymmetric frequency tuning hypothesis is really valid. This hypothesis actually, which, uh, I mean, there's, it, it has been raised by, by Ariana Felizati, working with uh, Ma, uh, Martin Fisher and Shaki also, uh, posits that perhaps actually the explanation to this fact uh, is, the, uh, is the possibility of having lateralization of spatial frequency processing. Like for instance, uh, in the case of the bee, in which there is no chiasma, that's the difference with the uh, human brain, actually. So what is seen with the left goes to the left hemisphere. What is seen with the right is go, go, it's, goes to the right hemisphere. So perhaps the left hemisphere is better at processing low spatial frequencies, which would be somehow related to smaller quantities, coarse objects, less objects, while the right hemisphere will be better at processing high spatial frequencies, which would relate to more uh, stimuli. Uh, we're trying to do right now, and. Ariana Felizati hopefully is coming to our group to address this, this question. So, but now I would like to show you an experiment which shows that not everything is fantastic as we would believe or expect, and that's good actually, because it's what we are looking for also. So where are the limits, okay? That's an essential question. Uh, the argument is not to say bees are incredibly flying monkeys or, or whatever. That's not the point. It's also to ask where are the limits, where this starts, where it doesn't start. And this is an experiment uh, which was actually done to ask the question, can bees relate symbols to quantities? Which is an essential question actually uh, for this audience actually. Can they, for instance, learn association between signs used as labels and non-symbolic numbers, so certain quantity of dots. Uh, and the point also, the essential question to me was, are these associations reversible? This is why I asked you yesterday the question about the reversibility, because I consider this is an, an essential point. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, is this symbolic number representation possible? in bees if something like this works and is it fundamentally different from what we found in humans and learns in terms of behavioral outcomes. So this is an experiment which was done uh, actually um, uh, with my friend uh, Adrian Dyer uh, in Australia and Scarlett Howard who is the postdoc in the lab who did the zero story by the way, uh, Aggie. So Scarlett, um, you can see here now she's a, a young professor in Melbourne. And, and she did this experiment actually in which the question was, uh, or the experiment was to train a group of bees to uh, sign to numerosity matching task. That's group one, okay? And another group was trained to a numerosity to sign matching task, group number two. So for instance, the bees in group number one, one and the same bee for instance, would have to learn that every time there is N shown at the entrance in the maze, it has to go for two. And every time it's, it's the uh, inverted T is shown, it has to go for three, okay? So it's this kind of association. But the same bee learns both, 
and two, and inverted T means three. In the other group, is the other way around. So if they see two, they have to go for N, and if they have three, they have to go to T. So this is, this is actually the maze, and that's the idea um, of, of how these experiments were done. Uh, here you see, for instance, the group train from sign to number. So they see, for instance, N, oh, I don't see my mouse here. Oh, I use this. Okay, they see uh, N at the entrance of, of the maze, and then it means that they have to go to two and not to three. Uh, and if they see the inverted T, they would have to go to three. And of course, the twos and the threes would change along the visits. It's not the same twos, it's not the same threes. There would be twos and threes, but of course, everything was uh, controlled in terms to avoid the use of low level cues. Um, and the other group, for instance, the group trained from number to sign, would see three, and in this case, it would have to go to inverted T, and if it, uh, it see two, it has to go to M. So that's the, the idea of these experiments. Uh, but the, the most interesting part of the experiment is that, of course, the animals were trained along a lot of visits. Typically, these experiments required, as I mentioned before, from 30 to 50 visits for the animals to extract, actually, the regularities from the different stimuli that they use. Mm -hmm. And uh, 50 training visits to the maze, and then the animals were tested in two tests, in, in four types of tests. These tests are uh, very interesting, actually, because uh, one of them will be the key, key critical test. The one, is the one of these tests will be the one in which you will reverse. So, for instance, the animals being trained to N and then 2, they will see 2 and then N and T. What they would do in this particular situation would be able to reverse the association. So, uh, the other tests were more controlled tests, uh, but I'm showing you this now. So, for instance, this is the group train uh, to go from signs to numbers. You see, they saw N at the entrance, and then they have to go to 2, not to 3. They come back, they see the inverted T, and then they have to go to 3, not to 2. And so on, along 50 training visits, you see N again, then you have to go to 2. Of course, you randomize sites all the time, you control for low-level cues, you change the stimuli, but the rule is always there. N, 2, inverted T, 3. And then come the tests. I say four tests. One is a test using novel stimuli, actually. You can see with different shapes and colors that were never used in the experiment, just to see if the animals are disoriented or they just play the game in the same way. Uh, another test is an, a test in which we had, again, two versus three, but the total area was exactly the same in the stimuli, just to control for that again. And this is uh, another test in which we had, again, two versus three, in which each element has the same size, again, to control for another possible low level Q. And that's interesting test. Now, we reverse, actually, the situation. We present two and N versus two inverted T. What they would do, knowing that there is this association, would they go to the N? Yes or no? This is what happened. This is the training, actually. So th this phase which is the 50 visits to the maze. So you see that the animals learn very well. So they master this situation, N2 inverted T3, irrespective of the fact that you were changing the stimuli all the time. They learn very well. But now come the situation of the four test. Here you see. So this is the test in which you have the novel stimuli with colors. They manage that very well. The, the two other tests in which you control parameters of the stimuli, they manage them very well. This is significantly different from a random choice, but this one, they were not able to do it. They could not reverse uh, the, the, the association in this particular case. So uh, the, they failed in the reversal test associating number to sign, okay? So irrespectively of the fact that they could really learn to match signs to numbers. It goes in one direction, but not in both directions. What about the other group? So the other group you can see here, again, now it's number to sign, two, N, three, T, and so on, 50 times. And now, again, now we have to show the three with a different color because we cannot change, of course, the, the signs. The signs have to be constant. So we change the, 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 the color display and so on. Uh, expecting that in this particular case, because it's three, they should go to T. And here, again, same area, they should go to T. And here, they should go to T. But now, critical question, what they would do 
in this situation in which we reverse, we show the inverted yield, would they go for three in this particular case? Again, the learning worked very well. You see that during these 50 training trials, they managed to learn the double association, but we got the same result for the test. They managed very well the test in which the rule was preserved, uh, but when we reversed the association, they failed. So uh, they match numbers to signs, uh, and they could transfer to novel stimuli that preserve the previous situation, but they fail in the reversal test associating symbols to numbers. So this is interesting because um, they show a capacity to solve these double associations, which is already a lot, actually, during each training phase, but they were unable to transfer the acquired relationship to a reverse matching task. Uh, this seems to be apparently reversible, but I have some doubts. <coughs> I'm wondering, actually, what would happen, and this experiment has not yet been done, if I would train an animal with n and then go to 2, and then uh, at the same time 3 go to t. So not just symbol uh, or label sign to number, but combining the two in the same animal. Uh, and then to present novel situations. Would that work? We don't know. Uh, at least the experiment is quite clear. In the way the experiment was done, they were not able to do it. Uh, which means that the signs, at least in these experiments, would not be handled as symbols, which is a limitation for, for the kind of numerosity we are describing here. Uh, there are many questions. So the one I raised already. So if we train them with this double form of association, would they, at the end, be able to reverse? That we don't know. Uh, like, like the experiment here. So training to n going to 2, and then 3 going to t. And then would they be able to reverse this one and this one? Um, that we don't know. Another question is that, uh, which I mentioned already, is that uh, they seem to be able to capture these abstract relationships and generalize their knowledge to novel stimuli using extensive training, okay, 30, 50 visits, we need a lot of examples and so on, and then it works very nicely, as you can see. Uh, this, um, this does not fit what you guys see in, in children, which require fewer uh, trials to abstract this situation. So the uh, question is, is this also a limitation? It's only extensive training that enables this capacity in bees, or if we find appropriate protocols and paradigm, can we see also some kind of fast emergence of the concept that we still don't know. So, uh, and what I would like to know, because I have the possibilities of doing that, is which brain areas are involved in this problem solving, and this problem is accessible. Let me show you what we are doing right now. This, this is something that, uh, the way to, to answer the last question. So we implemented a system of virtual reality for bees. Uh, the bees actually uh, are uh, fixed from the thorax. You can see a little bit here. There is a holder here glued to the thorax. And the animal is set onto a styrofoam ball here floating on an air cushion. So the animal walks stationary like a treadmill. And uh, it might walk and have the impression that it moves forward, turns to the right and the left, because there are landscapes here actually or stimuli that are shown to them which move according to the bee's movement. And you can reconstruct the trajectory of the bee using all the captures that you have all around. So here's the bee, here's the holder, here's the screen. And for instance, you will see, uh, uh, sorry, things like this. Actually, this is not existing. These are just images projected to the bee. And for instance, this is a reconstruction of what a bee did in this problem. Uh, it's rewarded by every correct choice. So when the animal points or, uh, or faces the right stimuli, it gets a reward. And you can see here, for instance, an animal choosing the right stimulus in, the, in this virtual reality. It works very well. So we have shown already with different experiments that they can learn, for instance, to discriminate very similar yet different gratings, like here or here. And the advantage is that you can expose the brain of the animals uh, while the animals are doing that, because the cuticle, which covers the insect body, is just an armory. You can cut a hole expose the brain and record life while the animal is behaving. So this is what you can see here, the ball. You can see the bee here. The bee has the brain exposed. And here, this is an experiment in which you see here the, the landscape. And calcium imaging is used here to record activity of neurons in the visual circuit. We're still trying to process this data. 
hopefully available for the next conference if I have the chance to come back. Or doing electrophysiology, actually, recording actually in uh, brain areas while the animal is making the choice is what we are doing now to uh, answer the question of uh, what are the areas involved in this particular problem solving. So uh, I would like to, to finish by showing you a new experiment that is not yet published, and it's uh, something quite new, but I think it's exciting to discuss with an, an audience like the one I'm facing here. It's actually a, a question related to awareness. The more you work with these animals, the more the question comes all the time. And of course, I will use my words uh, in a cautious way, but the typical question is, is there something like consciousness in these animals? Okay, it might sound like, a, oh my God, he's a heretic talking about that. But, but, but I mean, you see the performances and you cannot stop thinking about what could be behind all these performances. And I will not speak about consciousness because of course it would be too much, but I would like to speak about awareness. And, uh, and in this case, I would like to show you some experiments, new experiments, which are not uh, uh, using visual stimuli and free-flying bees, but now our experiments, um, these are experiments on olfactory learning with harness bees, bees that are immobilized and nevertheless learn very well to associate uh, uh, odors with sugar reward. So, um, but what is the inspiration of this work? This work actually was inspired by a classic work you might know by Clark and Squire actually, uh, using uh, the protocols called delay and trace conditioning. Uh, which are two forms of condition described by Pavlov long ago, long ago, but which yield very different results and which imply different, very different cognitive resources. So um, what is that? So delay is essentially the fact that you have uh, a conditioned stimulus, for instance, say a tone uh, here, and an unconditioned stimulus here, say a reward or a, a punishment, a mild shock in this case, overlapping. So this is the typical protocol of delay condition. This is what everyone uses because that what facilitates the overlap is what facilitates the learning of the association between these two stimuli, the tone and the shock, the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimuli. Pavlov described long ago the trace conditioning situation, which is the one you have here. Essentially, it's the same. You have essentially the same conditioned stimulus, a tone, same duration, a mild shock, same duration, but the critical difference is that there is a gap between both. There is a temporal gap. Yet, so you might argue, well, then it's difficult because the stimuli are separated in time. It is indeed difficult. Pavlov reported that animals had difficulties, yet they learn the association. And uh, the argument that was provided at the time and later developed is that the animals, uh, this one is more challenging in the sense that the animals have to create a representation of the condition stimulus and transport it, create a trace that is uh, actually transported in time to be able to uh, make the connection with the delayed unconditioned stimulus. That's the idea. So uh, with this in mind, the experiment I was mentioning, the Clark and Square paper actually, uh, which this one actually did a wonderful work actually using these two protocols. Uh, they uh, actually asked people to watch a silent movie, okay? People were sitting there and with the instruction, pay attention to the movie because I will ask you questions about what you have seen in the movie. But at the same time, without telling anything to these people, they were doing this using the so-called eye blink cognition. So means by that that the people were watching the movie, but suddenly there was a tone, and suddenly there was an air puff going to the eye of the subject. Okay, so the, the idea: what is this eye blink conditioning protocol? So when you uh, hear the tone, and the tone predicts the air puff coming to your eye, and then you blink, then you will learn to blink actually to close your eye to the tone which predicts the arrival of the air puff. So and and they did that in two ways: a group of people were actually subjected to the movie and the eye blink conditioning in the delay situation here, so tone and immediately the air puff, and another group in the trace situation, okay, like this. Is it clear? Yeah, I hope so. So the idea is that the people are not aware of what's going on, except that they have to watch the movie. But this was going on in a form of, say, delay or trace condition, depending on the group. 
And so this is what happened, actually. So uh, what you see here is what these people learn to respond to the tone, OK? So they're watching the movie, and then you record if they are uh, closing their eye to the tone, OK? Respectively to the fact that they were not instructed to do so. You see that, uh, uh, and you, s you see two curves here, actually, because after the experiment, they ask the people, were you aware that there was something going on? And some people say, no, I just was paying attention to the movie. And other people say, yes, yes, I realized that every time the tone was there, I got an air puff on the eye, and that was very uh, uh, disturbing, and so on. You can see that these two groups are here, OK? Aware people and unaware people. When they use the delay conditioning, no differences. So both groups learn very well. Aware or awareness didn't play any role in this situation. When they used the trace conditioning, okay, there was something very, very funny here. Because only the people that reported being aware of the situation learn the task. When the people say, no, I didn't realize anything, they didn't learn at all, okay, contrary to here. But if they say, yes, yes, I realized that there was a tone, and a little bit later there was an air puff, they learned that. Okay, so they say, look, this is funny because awareness seems to be the condition necessary to learn the trace association in this particular case. Okay, so unaware subjects succeed in delay, but not in trace, you can see here. And uh, it means that the trace conditioning require awareness of the CSUS, so tone uh, air path association. And of course, uh, they go farther than that, but I will not go in this direction because they say, they speak about conscious awareness, and they even show that hippocampus is necessary for this and not for this, okay? So, but uh, we, so could we do something like that to the bees? Is it possible to do, well, of course, bees would not watch a silent movie, but there is something, of course, that we could do, and this is what we did. We use a different protocol that I would like to introduce now, which is, the olfactory conditioning of the proboscis extension response. Very complicated name to say something very easy, which is the proboscis extension is they extend the tongue anytime their antennae are touched with a drop of sugar. The, the antennae telling them, oh, there is reward, boom, the tongue goes out. It's a reflex, reflexive response, okay? And what you use, it's like Pavlov's dove, actually. So instead of using a bell to anticipate the arrival of meat, say, you use another to anticipate the arrival of sugar. Uh, and this is the way it works. You use immobilized bees. So you can see here, you put every little bee into a little tube, just the head going out. It's very practical because at the same time you can access the nervous system and things like that, but we are not going into that now. But, uh, and, and these bees will be actually uh, uh, presented. Here's the bee. Uh, there's a camera recording and things like that. And this is a machine actually that will be sent uh, an odorant to the animal. We use a neutral odorant that does not elicit any kind of response to the animal, and that will be followed immediately by sugar reward. So this is the little bit, okay? Will be followed by sugar reward to the antennae to elicit this proposed extension. So that's the way it works. I think this movie is much better than 1,000 words. So here you see the bee, and you will see a red square showing here the moment in which the odor is shown for the first time, and you will see no reaction to the odor. Now, but now you come with the sugar water. You see here, this is a toothpick. Soak it in sugar water. Touch the antenna, and you see the proboscis extension. We like it very much. You see, it's insisting. Give me more. And by doing that, actually, you have created this association between odor and sugar. And the proof that this is the case is now shown here. Actually, you now give the odor alone in the absence of sugar. And this is what happens. Tack, OK? So, and you can see here, it's a Pavlovian protocol in which the odorant acts as a conditioned stimulus, the sucrose as an unconditioned stimulus. And then it's possible to have a delay version and a trace version, like they did with the tone and the air puff. Um, and so this is what we did. This is an experiment done by my student, Catherine Macri. And actually, uh, we uh, used the odorant, OK? And this is the sugar. And uh, in, for the trace, we shortened the odorant because we proved that they learn much better in this situation. Uh, and, uh, but the interval is the same, and, and, and now you have the gap between the odor and the sugar. Okay, so, um, so the idea is that um, 
because they say that if trace condition was proposed for conscious awareness, actually, I, this is why I put it in quotes, uh, actually, uh, let's see if we can use this to ask RB. So first question was whether they can learn at all uh, under these conditions. They can learn this without any problem, but they can learn this. Can they learn this? So I will move faster, sorry. Here. So what, this is what we wanted to know. We wanted to do delay and trace conditioning uh, to see whether they learn, to compare the learning in both conditions. We expect this one to be more difficult, of course. Uh, but then the question was, what if we use these structures? If we use these structures, would we interrupt something like awareness in the trace situation, but not in the delay? Would we actually kill the trace conditioning learning, but not the delay conditioning learning, like in the human subject? Okay, remember the human subjects had the delay conditioning, and being or not aware didn't play any role. They learn in both cases. But what about the, the situation here? Uh, and, and this is what we got. This is the learning, actually. This is four, five times other sugar, okay? Other sugar, other sugar, other sugar. And this is how they extend the proboscis, proboscis extension response to the other, so the learned response. This is the delay situation. As expected, they learn very well. You can see they, how good they are already. After the one experience, they are already at 80% correct choices or correct responses. And the trace conditioning was also learned. Less efficiently, but nevertheless learned, which was a good start for us. Okay? So it shows that, as Pablo said, this one is more difficult. Okay? But they learned that nevertheless. So, and the memory, okay, of course, was there uh, for the delay conditioning. They remember one hour and 24 hours later. For the trace conditioning, of course, the levels are lower, but they still remember one hour, 24 hour later. So, and we take, of course, care of controlling that in the trace situation, there were no rest of odorant in the setup because otherwise it makes no sense. So we use a, a photo ionization detector to show that when you provide the odor, which is this moment, tuck in the interval, in the trace, the odor disappears. This actually is a machine that detects the presence of odor and it shows that in the trace, nothing was left. So we are sure that the animals are using indeed a trace of the stimulus and not some leftovers of the odor in the space. Uh, and we also did this, which is very interesting actually, to show how the behavioral response changed in the delay and trace conditioning. Here we use actually a deep lab cut quantification. It's a way to record uh, the proboscis movements and, and measure the latency actually to respond. So essentially we, we set some uh, arbitrary points on our video recordings and we can actually quantify in the recordings the extension, the delay, the duration and things like that, okay? And what you got in these two situations is this. You can see that in the delay situation, they are very fast. This is the latency, okay, to respond. But in the trace, somehow they are like refraining from extending the proboscis. It's like something that looks like timing the stimulus interval uh, in, the, in, in this situation. You can see it here. So they seem to refrain from extending immediately the proboscis. But the critical experiment comes now. This is the distractor situation. So now we have, again, this delay conditioning group, the trace conditioning group, but we will introduce these structures here or here. Uh, you don't see my mouse. Uh, here or here, okay? To see whether it affects one case and not the other or vice versa. So uh, we are, uh, uh, applied very short distractors, 100 milliseconds. It, they could be either mechanos, uh, uh, sensory distractors or a flash of light. Here I'm showing you, for instance, the mechanosensory distractor. The V is here. The odor is coming from here. The sugar will be delivered here. And from the back, we disturb the bee by doing this. It's very fast. You will see. Tuck. Did you see that? I show it again. So it was a 100 millisecond contact uh, provided uh, yeah, in this particular moment during the gap to see if actually it was, it was disturbing something like the awareness necessary to create the association between the odor and the sugar. Uh, okay, and of course, it was not always in the same position. It moved randomly from B to B, from trial to trial, and so on. Okay, this is what we got. For delay conditioning, okay, overlap between odor and sugar. Like in the humans, you can use or not these structures, you get the same performance. They learn equally well, 
okay? With or without the distractors, they learn equally well. With the trace conditioning, without distractors, they learn as shown before, but if you in introduce the distractors, it goes down significantly. So the distractors are indeed distracting the bees, actually, uh, when they are provided during this gap, uh, and, and disrupting the learning. The memory, you see the same, okay? This is a memory. Uh, one hour later, you see that for the delay group, nothing changes. For the trace group, the memory is impaired, of course, uh, in this particular case. So uh, we use another distractor, actually, as I say, the flash of light, a 100 millisecond light flash, and we got exactly the same result. The light, the, the light flash has no effect in the late situation, but it has an effect in the trace situation. So arguing in favor of, of actually the animals, like claim for the human subjects, being necessarily aware in the trace situation of the fact that when the, say, order is coming, they have to report this information in time to create the association with children. We control, of course, that because, because the distractor came closer to the sugar, because it was in between, they were not learning, actually, that the distractor predicted the sugar. And you can see here that uh, no animal reacted to the distractor practically uh, in all these situations. So they didn't learn the distractor. They just, the distractor was just a distractor. And uh, so, um, yes, so we think that there is an attentional awareness explanation plausible for these results. Of course, I'm using my words casually because this is not yet published, but uh, what I'm saying here is that they both learned the delay and trace association, okay, with different levels of efficiency, but they learned both. Uh, and when they are simulated with a distractor during the conditioning trials, they succeed in the delayed situation when there is stimulus overlap, but they do not succeed in the trace situation, okay? So, irrespectively of the nature of the distractors you use, you get the same results, okay? These distractors impair specifically the trace conditioning. So this might suggest that bees, like humans, uh, might be aware of the contingency between the CS and the US in these trace conditioning. We need more experiments, but this is actually what I would like to argue so far. So I'm coming to the end of this talk. Um, so I hope to to have convinced you that bees are a cool subject, subject to study, actually, when you ask questions about cognitive science, because um, as uh, Carl von Frisch, you might have heard about him, a Nobel Prize who discovered the dance of bees as a mean of communication. He used to say, bees are like a magic well. The more you draw water from them, the more water there is to draw. So, and, and that's exactly what I feel because, I mean, uh, they, they, they allow us this, this incredible feeling of, of, of excitement and, and uh, with new discoveries coming after each step we do. So what I would like to, to, to mention is that uh, I, I show you that there is a bee brain like the one you can see here in which you can identify specific brain areas like the visual areas and all the olfactory areas or integration areas and so on. And you can also identify and trace specific neurons and, and so on which produce uh, uh, appropriate behavior, rigid behavior, but also plastic beha behavior which goes beyond simple associative learning. These animals are not just associative machines. They do more, and I, I hope you have seen that today. The, uh, the brain, as I say, is simple. Remember, I say in quotes at the very beginning, it's simple, of course, because of the amount of neurons, but it's not rudimentary, I would say, in terms of the outcome it provides. Okay, they learn and differ uh, memorize different types of information, uh, and the neural circuits might be simple in terms of the number of neurons, but neither in terms of sophistication nor in terms of performance. We have seen conceptual forms of learning, we have seen numerosity, uh, we have seen the equivalent of a mental number line. Uh, does arguing in favor of biological roots for some forms of these cognitive capacities, okay? Uh, we have seen also limitations. Uh, we have seen that there is incapacity so far to handle signs as symbols for numbers, but more experiments are necessary for this. And I'm showing you also, I show you also these uh, new experiments uh, pointing out that in certain situations there might be necessity of awareness to solve particular problems like the trace conditioning situation. So, and uh, just the last point is that 
you see, this is not just for cognitive science primates. Uh, this is not just for neuroscience drosophila. Uh, this is a non-traditional model system. Uh, non-traditional, I mean by that, but because, for instance, you cannot do transgenesis here. But you have such a rich world, actually, of possibilities by asking questions to these animals. And that's what I actually uh, ask for in neuroscience or in cognitive neuroscience, that we open our minds to multiple models, multiple systems, to understand the evolutionary value of the capacities or, or where they start, really, uh, these capacities that we are all interested in. So I'd like to finish by thanking, actually, my team. This is my team in Paris, actually. Uh, and these are the colleagues I mentioned during the talk, which uh, uh, actually contributed to the works I presented you today. And thanks again for your patience and attention. All right, so we have some time for questions. Valentin. Thank you for this really, really exciting talk. Um, I'm wondering when you talk about, so I tried to ask this question by striking a balance between two claims you made, that these bees are not associative machines, yet they are not necessarily be able to use signs as symbols. And I wonder, um, that in light of these new developments, but uh, in artificial intelligence, but actually <clears throat> in, uh, uh, in general, in connectionist network modeling, um, do you think that these, uh, these feats that the bees show are possible to fully implement? Uh, and the question is more conceptual on, on Mars levels of of computation algorithm and implementation, that do you think that bees are using any kind of symbolic level representation, even if they are not able to use symbols mm. proper, uh, or are the underlying mechanisms are all associative as in a neural network, mm. and it's an epiphenomenal thing that these experiments report? Uh, that's, that's a very good question, actually. Um, so first of all, when I say just associative machines, don't misunderstand me. Of course, they learn associations, and of course, they use that in many contexts all the time. Uh, what I'm trying to say is just go against the view that they actually are reduced to that. Okay, that, that's my point. But for sure, they, they, they learn a lot of simple association, and, most, and, and many aspects of their behavior is guided by this associative learning. Okay, so in terms of these um, computational approaches, uh, there are things that can be definitely reproduced by, by, by neural networks. For instance, the last part, the trace conditioning versus the delay, we have been working with some people, actually, uh, in computational biology, and we have already a network that somehow can reproduce that. The key issue, however, is that we were able to identify specific circuits of neurons that may modulate attention. And when you implement this in the network, then it works. If you were not able to know that, then actually, if we didn't implement this, this particular uh, circuit element in the network, uh, it was impossible to solve the task. So uh, for some approaches, yes. Uh, there have been actually attempts to do some modeling of the conceptual learning, but uh, they were not very satisfying, I would say. So um, that for the computational part. Concerning the part of whether they would be some forms of symbolic representation, uh, that's a difficult one, actually, um, because we have to rely on experiments, and the only thing we have is the experiments telling you yes or no, uh, and, and uh, otherwise it would be wild speculation. But, I mean, wild speculation would be, people have argued about the symbolic value in dense communication where the movements actually are used as a kind of symbol to report, say, directions and distance. Not only directions, but specific distance to fly. This, again, is an open question. So is the dance a symbolic form of communication? Uh, we haven't, I mean, mentioned the dance here today, but just for those who are not familiar, bees have a dance in the hive. They perform particular dance, uh, which encodes the distance and direction to be flown by the partners to identify where the food source is. So I'm, 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 I'm 
I think I'm afraid I cannot really answer the symbolic part of your question because we don't know and we need more experiments to address it. But the first part, I think, I, I hope I have answered. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. That was fascinating. I have a question also um, relating to the symbol number uh, thing, and it might be very naive, but I thought um, whether it could also be the case that the bees just interpret this experiment as a um, conditional um, situation um, rather than a biconditional one. So I was thinking if children, for example, acquire symbol meaning and acquire word meaning, they also usually get evidence from both sides, right? So mm -hmm. they see a dog and then someone utters dog and the other way around. So maybe um, it's not like they lack the capacity of this like reverse um, thing, but they just like would need, yeah, you know, evidence from both I, sides. I, I totally agree. So this is why I mentioned that per perhaps the right experiment is still missing to combine both uh, in the same kind of training and to test the animals with a novel situation which they would be able to apply or not a reversible situation. I totally agree. Um, but so far, yes, you could argue in this direction, yes. Um, and, and this is why we have to be critical and find the right experiment to, to see whether this is a real limitation or no. It is something that was somehow uh, induced by the training. I totally agree. Thank you. I mean, this makes one's imagination fly, and so uh, uh, this may be a little bit outstretched, but, but uh, what you have presented suggests to me that this may be possible to experimentally approach this question. Uh, it relates to what you just mentioned about the bee dance and uh, the capturing relational stimuli like sameness. So, so there is a certain aspect of the abstract aspects of the stimulus are informative about uh, distances, directions, etc. So I wonder whether something that, like what we find in very young infants, now three months old, is that two-dimensional representations, virtual representations of jumping over an obstacle, jumping over a uh, two-dimensional form are interpreted by, ch uh, by infants as uh, translated into a three-dimensional uh, uh, scene with a solid object. So, so jumping over a, a figure is interpreted as, as a, a solid obstacle, so you have to, rational approach involves have to go around it. And uh, when that is removed, you expect uh, the agent to go straight so I was wondering whether there would be a way to, to see whether uh, just as like abstract aspects of similarity or sameness of uh, feature, features, whether some sensitivity to, to uh, similarity across th three-dimensional world mm. uh, of physical objects uh, and two-dimensional representations would be possible to for these that clever animals a, to uh, yeah, That would be a very cool question, actually. That has not been done so far. Uh, I would restrict the question to, say, a local area or local search area, because what is known is that when they navigate over distance and they pass objects and so on, they like the chairs and so on, they compute just the, the integrated vector. So they, that's what they report in the dance. So we have to exclude that for, for addressing your question. But this could be done, say, in mazes in which they have to turn or pass objects. And that could be done, actually. That would be very cool to do. Come to Paris and we do it. <laughs> I want to dig a little deeper into the, the frequency tuning hypothesis you mentioned at the end of the first part of the talk. I was just curious about, so, so they have frequency tuning, but how does that lead to this kind of snark effect? Because is the idea that there's some kind of direct link where the tuning actually changes their trajectory, or is it something like fluency even? Yeah, so 
this is, uh, first of all, I would try to clarify that we still don't know if they have this lateralization of frequency tuning. We know that they have lateralization, that's what I mentioned, for uh, other forms of visual processing and for other processing. Uh, that we have shown, that is known. But for the frequencies, there is what we would like to address right now with Ariana Felizate. Uh, the idea would be that, um, I mean, um, you have, you, you, sh you should be able to show that in, in the virtual circuits that you can identify and follow actually, uh, processing of uh, fine spatial frequencies is different compared to uh, coarse spatial frequencies on the left and on the right brain hemisphere. That's the first point you need to know. Uh, then of course what you need is uh, to see how this is actually wired in terms of decision making. Uh, that's what you're asking. Um, what I can say to that is that at least in the case of insects and the case of bees, we can exclude one of the hypotheses that was, by, was provided for, for this NARC effect uh, by Giorgio Valortigara, which is the emotional balance hypothesis. I probably know that, claiming that actually small quantities are related to kind of aversive and avoidance feeling and process with the actually uh, uh, right hemisphere and, and uh, so meaning because of the chiasma, you put it on the left, and the opposite for, for larger quantities. That, that does not apply to bees because output neurons mediating decisions exist and have been characterized in terms of positive and negative balances and they are equally distributed and equally functional in both sides of the brain. So we cannot argue in the case of insects that there is one hemisphere more tuned to say approach towards positive, emotionally positive stimuli, stimuli and the other to avoid. That definitely does not work. So um, the question that then what is needed is to see how, if any, this spatial tuning for frequency actually wires into these neurons. Uh, if it's actually also giving more weight to some neurons on one side or not, that we don't know. This is, this is a project that we hopefully will start when, when Ariana comes to the lab and that involves also Marco Paoli, who is here, actually in the middle of the image because he's the guy doing the brain imaging uh, of these uh, neural circuits in, in, in our lab. So I'm afraid that it's only speculation right now. Thank you, really amazing. I had a question um, related to the last experiment, the awareness experiment, and I was wondering whether it will be more convincing to to show the same effect in a task where they show the same kind of learning, but then they show no generalization in one condition or no transfer, if they were ever showing transfer or reverse learning. Uh, and related to that, was there ever any B which showed actually individually reverse learning in your task? Because yeah. of course, um, yeah. Very good point, because this is exactly what we are doing. So uh, I, I was aware of that and uh, in the sense that uh, I wanted to show that in other experimental protocols we might get the same effect, if any. And we use the reversal learning protocol, so essentially what you do is you train a B with two orders, one order A rewarded, one order B non-rewarded. And the bees learn very well and very easily to make the difference, to respond to the one that is rewarded and to uh, stop responding to the non-rewarded order. Then at, at, at a certain point you revert the rule. So it's B rewarded and A non-rewarded. And they are also very fast to solve this problem. They can do it very, very well. Um, makes sense by the way in biological terms because that's why they stop responding to non-rewarding flowers and moving to another species in the field. They have to track this kind of situation. So they are very good at doing that. Um, and now the, what we uh, are doing is to do this reversal learning in delay and trace conditionings and using the distractor. So why we do that? Because we wanted to do that in a different protocol, actually, uh, in a different paradigm, we get the same results, which I think is what you are actually arguing. Yeah, necessary, and this is what we are doing, for sure. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll let you know what happens. <laughs> okay, thanks again, Martin. It was wonderful. Thanks, thanks a lot.